The president likes to say in his campaign speeches that the Republicans drove the economy into a ditch. We've gotten it out of a ditch, and now they want the car keys back. I think a more accurate analogy would be to say that the Republicans drove the economy into a ditch. They were heading pell-mell off the cliff. We stopped them from going off the cliff, but we're still stuck in the ditch. And we're going to remain stuck in the ditch for a long time to come, if we, and that means very high unemployment and misery rates, if we don't change. There isn't enough money in society. There isn't enough spending power in the middle class because all the money has gone to the top over the last 30 years. So you don't have a broad middle class that can afford to buy the products and get the uh, economy moving again. The only way out of that is for government to spend money in the form of infrastructure, in the form of roads, highways, bridges, rail, broadband, greening buildings, you name it, to get money into the hands of people who will spend it. We call that a stimulus bill. We have plenty of things to do with stimulus money. We have global warming. We can respond to that. We can, start, we can do all the work we have to do that you all know about in greening our buildings and greening our energy and greening everything else. Secondly, long term, we have to put our fiscal house in order. But that means a tax system that will support infrastructure investment in greening the country. It means a tax system that will support social investment and education and, all the, and health care and all the other things we talk about but aren't doing enough about. And you can't talk about uh, putting our fiscal house in order and doing what we have to do at home to make us a competitive economy and to keep social justice if you keep wasting money on wasteful and stupid wars. There's an ancient maxim in law that says there is no right without a remedy. But now we have a new doctrine called the state secrets doctrine. You sue to allege that the government has violated your rights by kidnapping you, by torturing you, by doing whatever. And the government answers that lawsuit by moving to dismiss the case and says dismiss the case without any hearing on the merits, without any hearing as to whether what plaintiff alleges is true or whatever. Why? Because the subject matter of the case is a state secret. Because hearing the case will necessitate the revelation of state secrets that will endanger the national security. And the court, without even looking into that question as to whether that's true or not, dismisses the case. So the magic incantation of the phrase state secrets can dismiss the case, and therefore there is no remedy. And the government can do anything, and you can't stop it, because if you try to go to court, they say state secrets, case dismissed. Now, that doctrine was first enunciated in the Bush administration, in that form. It was an older form, not quite as bad, but in that form, first enunciated in the Bush administration, and, uh, and, and adopted in the exact same form without any meaningful change at all by the Obama administration. That's gotta be stopped. It's gotta be changed, because otherwise we have no way <laughs> of, enf of enforcing any right. Um, and every attempt so far by people to, to say, you illegally wiretapped me, or you kidnapped me, or I was a victim of rendition, or whatever, has been stopped by use of the state secrets doctrine. But why do we have national security? To protect our lives, but also to protect our liberties. And if we give, give up our liberties, we have very little left. I'm very glad to be here because everybody here are part of some business or enterprise that are combining doing good things, doing good things for the economy, and doing good things for social justice. Thank you very much. We have a media system that doesn't give us the full range of views in this country, doesn't tell us about the work that so many of you are doing. But what gets me up in the morning is not just Aretha belting out respect, but it is thinking about editing a publication on many moving parts now that rights wrongs, fixes abuses, that holds corruption accountable and is a watchdog. And it is that that I think we need to make our democracy a strong one. We have a democracy under siege. The Supreme Court decision opened a floodgate, a sluice gate of money, co covert co corporate money coursing through the veins of our political system, a dagger directed at the heart of our democracy. 
Van Jones spoke this morning about hope 2.0. Yes, we can, and yes, we, organized people, will be the counter to organized money. That is the best antidote. And yes, we can fight for fair elections now. We can fight for a constitutional amendment declaring that corporations are not people, which I think we should. But what it's also going to take is your voice, because I don't believe we can have a just, equitable America without progressives and without socially responsible business people at the table. Now, let me tell you one thing that drives me crazy, is when they talk about President Obama as anti-business, give me a break. Like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he has essentially saved capitalism from the excesses of a system that is, was gutting. Was, we've seen the crisis. But there are still ideas out there, and this financial transaction tax has been adopted in Britain. It could bring in $180 billion a year and attack what to me is one of the great dangers of our time, which is the growing, virtually unprecedented inequality. If we want a world, and I do, where love and humor and beauty win out, then I think we need, we need to do something simple, and it's being done around the world, but we need to measure what we do by different standards. The GDP might have been a useful measure 100 years ago, but I think it's pretty moronic now. And we need to redefine how we measure our quality of life. Some of you, I am sure, are already working on that, but it is valuable to know that a, the French government, working with S Joseph Stiglitz, has commissioned a report on this and is beginning to implement a new way of measuring life, education, housing, environmental stewardship, health care. This is not a radical idea. Franklin Roosevelt's Economic Bill of Rights of 1944, affording every American the right to housing, to health care. He would be run out of Washington today as a subversive radical. In many ways, this Tea Party is a Trojan horse for some of the big corporate money in this country, the Koch brothers and others. But a group I've been involved with, Working America, which is an affiliate of the AFL-CIO, has gone door to door in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And what it finds is that those who, sometimes when they open the door, say, well, I think the Tea Party's kind of interesting. It's not that they're suffused with Tea Party rage, but they are confused. Not only do you see a gridlock and an ugliness, but you see a rollback of the social and economic progress, the civilizing advances of the 20th century. I mean, they want to privatize or gut Social Security, Medicare. They want to abolish the Department of Education. They want to roll back minimum wage. I mean, these are ugly, toxic ideas. But there are alliances to be made with communities that have long been off our terrain. Um, on environmental issues, for example, on poverty issues. And I think those are worth exploring. But I think we forget sometimes about the great work that has been done to build this country. And in that arena, the social compact is under attack. I thought of this the other day, whatever one thinks of Juan Williams firing. What it has done is opened up again the arena for the right to resurrect its long-term crusade to defund public media. There is an attack, especially virulent in this state, an attack on public sector workers. And in that attack on the public is an attack on what seems to me the counter to privatization. Now, I am for public-private partnerships. But privatization too often has led to the privatization of profit and the socialization of risk. History is on our side. That's a grand statement. But when you think of the extraordinary demographic shifts in this country and where we're heading with the young African Americans, Latinos, single women, this is the rising American electorate. This is a wave that is going to change this country, already has. 
but it's invisible in some ways to too many in power, as they redistribute power to the more powerful, as they redistribute wealth to the more wealthy. And I believe that your community could redefine what business, what economic development, what economic purpose means in a country that is so desperate for a way to build um, a more just, a more equitable, a more sustainable society. Because at the end of the day, any politics that blames the people, I believe, is dead on arrival. Thank you.